Okay, good afternoon. My name is David Dominguez, along with Gianni Jimenez and Genesis Vasquez. Uh, we're Group 10. Our advisor was uh, Professor Joyce Dewey Kravich. And we're here to talk to you about um, our design for a reactor control system for an orbital launch vehicle. Now, the purpose is to design, our purpose was to design a low cost reactor control system for a low cost small rocket, which is NASA's goal with the Nano Launch program. Now, the motivation for this is that we want more universities and research institutions to have easier access to space experimentation. And the results of that will be uh, the world will benefit by getting more data from space experiments, which is normally a very hard area to get data in from. Now, this is in NASA, this is actually uh, one of NASA's own documents from the NanoLunch program. And in their words, uh, you can see uh, that there's a need for dedicated affordable access to lower orbit for small payloads. And also, there's a need for vehicle platforms that allow for the testing of new technologies, such as our reaction control system. So currently, uh, you can see these are the typical uh, launch vehicles in use. So of course, the spatial here is just for size now, and these are coming in the future from NASA. Um, besides the cost, the problem with these is that if you want to send a CubeSat into orbit, you have to wait for one of these to be launching. You have to wait for them actually to have a CubeSat deployer. And you have to, they have to be going to an orbit that you're interested in. So you can see here the tallest one's about 110 meters. And the nano launch, on the other hand, is only about 20 meters tall. Now it's made up of five stages. The uh, first three stages um, are off the shelf sounding rockets. You can see that the top three uh, don't have any fins. Also, the, the, actually the fourth and fifth stages are being built in-house by NASA. Now, the top three don't have any fins because once the third stage activate, activates, it's going to be outside of the atmosphere. And outside of the atmosphere, there's no air, so you don't need fins. So the only way to control a rocket um, outside of the atmosphere is with, with a reaction control system. So it's basically like Newton, it uses Newton's third law, same as a rocket. You expel mass one direction, it pushes on you in the other direction. So you can see, for example, uh, the clip part of the space shuttle, it exhausts gas for a roll, and then exhaust gas in the opposite direction to stop. Now, the nano launch is going to launch at 75 degrees from the horizon. So it needs to pitch over to tangential to be able to accelerate to orbital velocity once it gets to the altitude that it needs. So this will be accomplished in two to three uh, pitch over maneuvers. And in order to pitch over, it's going to have to roll to the proper altitude and then pitch over to achieve the tangential uh, pitch. And now Genesis will talk to you about our objectives. Hello. So, and of course, we have to have some objectives when we start a project. So, we decided that we need to design a reaction control system that's low cost, easy to manufacture, and reliable. These things are important so we can keep the cost down so that this um, reaction control system can go on the nano launch rockets and we can launch many of them. Um, our task is to do proof of concept. We're not actually putting this right now onto a rocket. We just need to prove that this works, and then NASA can take it from there, do more extensive tests, and mount it on a rocket and test it in the atmosphere. So first, we did, we did preliminary computational fluid dynamic analysis. We did some rapid prototypes, prototyping, and we did some apparatus testing. And on RCS integration, RCS is short for reaction control system. That's up to NASA once we prove that this is something that's viable and reliable. So project management. Of course, we have to. We only have a limited amount of time to complete this project, so we have to split the task and the time in the most efficient manner. So, as you can see, most of our um, design tasks were here um, early during senior design one, and then um, the actual construction was during this semester. <coughs> um, David and, and Gianni collaborated in the in the CAD and manufacturing along with me. And that David is the one who's a NASA contact, so he works for NASA. He has contacts at NASA, and he made sure that we're abiding by their requirements. Um, Gianni also helped with the testing, and then also ran some flow simulations. Um, so environmental impact, always very important when you're thinking about any sort of project. How can this affect the world around us? So greenhouse gases released by rocket launches are actually only about 1% of the world's carbon dioxide emissions. Um, the rest of the aerospace industry, you know, aviation actually uses, um, produces a lot more. And that's still only about 2% of the world's carbon dioxide emissions. But as, you know, as rocket launch, rocket launches become more common, that might change. Uh, our RCS uses nitrogen. Uh, we'll 
is projected to use nitrogen in order to um, rotate the system. Um, instead of using, for example, hydrogen peroxide or hydrazine, which are very harmful and dangerous gases. So and at the end of life, net, the entire nanolunch rocket um, burns up in the atmosphere, as is standard for most of these small rockets. So of course, we also, when we're building this project, we have to have safety in mind. So we have to use the standards set by different organizations to ensure our safety and those people working on this project in the future. So um, for the nanolunch itself, it needs to follow the regulations of the Tripoli Rocket Association, TRA, the NAR, which is the National Association of Rocketry. Um, for the pipes and fittings that we use on here, we need to follow the, the NPT taper standards, so that's the National Pipe Threads, and the ASA, ANCI and ASME standards, B121. And the motor driver needs to follow the NEMA standard, which is the National Electrical Manufacturers Association, and the paintball tank, which is the tank that we use um, for our testing, because it has a, a, because it has a very high PSI that it can produce, that has to follow the code of federal regulations in order to be transported. So now I'm going to switch over to Gianni, who's going to talk about NASA's version of this RCS. Thank you. Thank you, Genesis. All right. While David was doing the internship at NASA, he was able to get a look at uh, NASA's reaction control system. He came up with this brilliant idea of reducing uh, the amount of pipe fittings and uh, tubing and materials to lower down the weight. So he brought it up to his supervisor, and his supervisor basically told him, go ahead with the project, build the concept, and come back to us. Uh, so here's a sketch of our prototype. This is actually a second stage prototype, as you can see on the table. Thank you to uh, Dr. Tremante, who let us uh, 3D print to get a broad idea of what we're uh, dealing with. Uh, it consists of the manifold, as uh, one input at the top and four outputs equally spaced and degree from each other. Uh, it consists of the rotary valve, which goes inside the manifold. Uh, the rotary valve consists also, has the same input at the top aligned with the manifold, and has two outwards exits 90 degrees from each other. Uh, these three parts were manufactured, the manifold, rotary bar, and the uh, uh, rear bracket to hold the whole system together. The rest of the parts were purchased. Now some of the design challenges we had was to consider pressure loss and the pipe fittings. There was a lot of them. These are the three prototy 3D prototypes we did. Um, the first one, David did a PLA in NASA. The second one, as I mentioned, the Thermante. And the third one uh, was outsourced to a Shapeways, 3D printed in steel. Now, the advantages of our system compared to NASA is that we have less um, failure points. NASA has four on and off uh, actuators that, comparing apples to apples, our systems to our systems, they have, we can consider they have four failure points. Ours only has one failure point because it has one on and off actuator. And the second one we needed to consider was the stepping motor uh, rotating the valve within. So we can call it that they have four failing points, ours has two failing points. Now here's a basic function and how uh, we came up with uh, uh, the design. Because it's a simple rocket, they only require four firing sequences. Uh, two of them for pitch or yaw, and the other two for counterclockwise and clockwise. So just bear with me with the diagram and see how it works. When the valve uh, is facing up, we get the move in a, a pitch or yaw in one direction. When the valve, I'm sorry, I skipped one. When the valve, you go. When the valve goes to the right on the other position, so we'll do the clockwise motion. The valve uh, goes point down, we'll do the opposite. And finally, when the valve faces left, it will do the counterclockwise. We did this by just simply crossing two of the pipe fittings on one side of the system, as you can see in the prototype. Now, NASA basically told us, look, concentrate on the concept. Don't worry about the amount of force you need to exert on this system in order to move the rocket. We did some basic analysis, uh, engineering analysis, just to make sure what numbers we were playing with. Uh, we found out that the velocity coming into the system is around 154 meters per second. For safety reasons, we needed to find these numbers again. Um, doing the basic broad fluid mechanics, we use the continuity equation, assuming that it's an incompressible fluid in a steady state. Um, continuity equation gives us the velocity coming in equals the velocity coming out. 154 meters per, se per second coming in equals 77, around 77 meters per second coming out. All this was theoretical. We did find the experimental data 
um, we found the velocity is around 154 meters per second. We did some simulations with console. We we're getting a bunch of errors due to the meshing, but we got one simulation to work and it was around 148 meters per second. Uh, the other consideration we took was the uh, viscous flowing pipes. Of course, the continuing question ignores friction factor. The second analysis, we consider the major and minor losses. Uh, major losses pertains to friction in pipings. Minor losses pertains to the bending and the valves and the teeth. Uh, again, design iteration. David did the first one at NASA. Uh, it was far more complicated because when we started this project, uh, NASA was requiring six to eight firing sequences. At the end, we ended up being only doing four, which is helped when we 3D printed with Dr. Uh, Termantes' lab. 3D printed the second prototype, which it helped increasingly on the final design, which is we made it out of stainless steel. Now here's a, the assembly. Once we had the second prototype, like he's, as you can see, the great one, it helped us uh, uh, start buying uh, uh, parts, uh, pipe fittings, uh, stepper motors, and, and nuts and bolts, all those things. Here's a mock-up on the assembly. And with that being said, I'm going to transfer to David, who's, who's going to talk about, about the manufacturing. Yes, our, our greatest challenge in manufacturing was the tolerances. Um, especially in the, uh, here where you can see A, B, and C. Because the top part of the manifold right here, uh, that needs to be very tight because that's the seat of the valve. So that prevents the valve from moving left and right uh, laterally because if it does, it could take away the seal, um, the bottom seal. Also, this, um, the bottom part of the manifold needs to be a little bit wider because we need to fit an O-ring in there to seal. And if, if that's a little too wide, then we'll lose that seal from that O-ring. Now, the C area here is because this is the change from the, in between the two diameters. And if this is too low and too close to the O-ring, it'll actually tear that O-ring. Um, so you can see that the tolerances are very tight, five thousandths of an inch, um, negative zero, plus zero, negative five thousandths of an inch. So very tight tolerance per here. So when we first submitted our drawing for manufacturing, we planned on getting it milled. Um, but the price came out to about $500 to get it milled. Because there's, besides those tolerances, there's other tolerances. So then we decided, well, let's 3D print it, and then we could just mill uh, this area right here, the area that really counts. So <laughs> we got the 3D print, as you saw before. Here it is again, and you can see it's a little rough, a little rough around the edges because 3D printing just comes out that way. And then, so what we did is we put it on the lathe, and we milled those areas um, that were very important, which is the valve to manifold interface. So the manifold needed just these, this pocket milled right here, whereas the valve needed the side and the top and also the, uh, where the O-rings fit in. Uh, now, you can see here, this is that, that 15 thousandths of an inch uh, pocket groove, uh, this part being for the O-ring to fit. And you can see the top here is, is uh, also machined because that's where the top O-ring seals. And here you can see them finished. You can see that the tapping's already done on all the holes for the uh, fittings, and uh, the O-rings are here on the valve. And this O-ring uh, will be compressed onto the, the inside of this manifold by that bracket. And this bracket was then manufactured with a, a CNC router. Um, we used a, an eighth of an inch G10, which is uh, resin with a fiberglass sheet on each side. And then we had the little uh, a groove in here for the, uh, the thrust bearing, which is what holds it, the valve against the manifold and lets it spin. And now, Janice, we'll talk about our control. All right. So in such a complex uh, operation as in you know, sending something to space, you don't just need mechanical engineers. You also need expertise from all sorts of people. For example, electrical engineering. This, um, this of course, requires some control electronics in order to, um, accurate, to accurately position the valve so we can get all those firing sequences. Because if the valve is halfway between the manifold, you know, the air won't be able to escape and it will build up and it won't be pretty. So, of course, we need to make a circuit for this. So, um, here's our circuit. You can see it here. This is our circuit, uh, our control circuit, and our battery. So, well, this will be mounted onto this assembly so that it will all spin together, and of course, in the final rocket. And here's the, the um, this is the on-off switch, which will uh, direct the air uh, onto the uh, 
um, and oh, and here's our um, motor, of course. Oh, and here's our little uh, our valve, so you can see how small it is actually compared to the motor. And here's a video of our testing. So here it's just spinning the motor to make sure that everything um, fits together with all the tolerances and all the challenges we face with that and it totally works. So that was awesome. And then we actually mounted the tank on it and we spun it. So we spun it backwards first. And you can see it immediately turned around the other way and produced plenty of torque and it was going really fast. And that's at a relatively low um, PSI provided by the speedball tank. Once it gets onto an actual rocket, we're going to have much higher PSI, a lot more force, a lot more torque. So that pretty much proves our concept that this does function. And of course, cost analysis. So um, NASA's prototype, they're just parts only. We're not taking into account labor costs, just their parts. It was about $1,500. Mostly it was the control valves, because those are about $400 each, and they needed four of them. So that brings up the price a lot. Um, we originally also asked, um, Swage locked it, how much it would cost to produce uh, this kind of valve, and they give us a quote for about $600. That's just the valve and some piping, not any of the other assembly to test it or to mount it. Um, the Engineering Manufacturing Center, when we were getting it machined, they quoted us um, about almost $500 just to get um, the valve and the, and the manifold milled out of um, steel, um, and actually out of Delray. And then uh, we ended up using um, our, the 3D print and machining that, and our final cost was $526 for this project. So feature work. So what can we do to make this even better? Well, we can make this part even smaller if we make it for welding. Instead of having all these spinnings involved, we can just weld it directly, which will be safer as well. And you have reduced the size of, of the valve manifold to this tiny, tiny um, part, which will be about the size of a quarter. And you can also use, um, consider using different uh, control valves in order to let the air in, the on-off valve, and see which one works best. So of course, this was a huge learning experience for us, bringing an idea just from concept to life. It, there were a lot of delays, like a lot of things, unexpected happenings. For example, we burned um, one of the parts on the circuit. You know, there was shipping delays, shapeways with 3D printing. They took an extra week to send us the part, and it was just, you know, there were some challenges we didn't expect, but it was a huge experience. That's what engineering life is. You have to plan for those kind of, un you have to plan for the unexpected, and then you have to make sure that you still keep on the timeline, since you have to make sure that you have extra time just in case for these kinds of things. And also, we need to keep using new and emerging technology, so we have to keep an eye on the field. If we hadn't um, considered the 3D printing it and stainless steel, which a lot of people don't even realize that's possible. Um, that brought down our costs a lot and ended up helping us for the final project. So in conclusion, we have a successful um, prototype for this reaction control system. NASA will continue doing um, um, testing on this and integrate it onto a rocket and test it in the atmosphere. And also, this was a great experience for us as budding engineers. So we're thankful for this opportunity. We're also thankful for Dr. Kravich, who's our advisor, NASA for giving us this opportunity, the Made Rock Laboratory for helping us with the analysis and for um, helping us also throughout the process, and it was huge thanks to Mr. Zagarelli who helped us with the machining and gave us great advice for during this project, and Neil Briggs who helped uh, buy some fittings for us. And of course, this is NASA like to say, it's not rocket science, oh wait, yes it is. <laughs> so, um, and you guys have any questions for us? you said that you reduced the number of failure modes from the baseline of the RSC design uh, and that it's half the weight and one-third the cost. One-third the cost, I see. So talk to me about how you reduce the number of failure modes in the design. You want to take it? Alright, so going back to NASA's design, they had, uh, as I mentioned before, four on and off valves, uh, four on and off actuators, uh, comparing apples to apples. Our system only has one, which we got from NASA, the one on top, and we're considering the stepping motor to be a second failure point. So just their own reaction control system for stage two, there's possibly two compared to four other. 
the, the biggest issue is the on and off valve because they, they have more chance of failing than anything else. Stepper motors have a long history of, of uh, you know, working well. Um, they, they don't fail that often, um, especially compared to, because the valve has to support such a high pressure. Um, it's not, it's not it's just not a common industry. And they haven't, I guess, um, gotten to the point where they're as reliable as, let's say, like, you know, a stepper motor. Uh, a good example is today's launch. What, what was it, guys? Oh, that was uh, due to valves. Yeah, actually, the, the Orion was launching this morning, and it was canceled due to uh, valves not functioning. <laughs> good timing. Very nice. <laughs> I'm just gonna, another question I have to ask on that is: like, typically, they use S-grade valves, space-grade valves. Is, this, is your reliability uh, predictors on each of these components that you have here? I'm sure NASA would use that on all of their. Well, um, this, as I said, is just a proof of concept. Um, NASA is actually planning if this was successful, they, they told us they were going to 3D print it in stainless steel and uh, titanium. So the, the actual valve component, this, that we printed in stainless steel, would be in titanium. And then they would make sure that, every, of course, that has to be everything they have is space grade. So, and, and that point, that, well, it's really out of our hands. At which time the price will be back up where yeah, the, the but last one sell us. Considering, I don't think though, with the next prototype was space grade yet. I mean, um, they were just doing roll tests with this one, right? Right. I mean, what, what, once the now that the concept has been proven, now they can actually manufacturing with all the tolerances that they use, they can do all the extensive testing to then get it space rated. Yeah. Yeah, but that'll be a long process. Okay. Uh, question I had on your design. You're talking about plus or minus two and a half thousandths on those tolerances. My question is, could you have added additional O-rings, maybe even metal O-rings, to to compensate for tolerance differences here, uh, or do you have to go? I to just that? use the the uh, the rubber ones because I, I scoop it out. I'm used to the rubber O-rings. Um, I'm not familiar with metal O-rings. I know they use those on pistons for cylinders. Um, I'm not sure how those would function with. If you system. put another O-ring on the top side of this, up in the A, a oh, area, right, 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 right. Yeah. then you probably wouldn't need this level of tolerance. That could be a consideration. We'll let NASA know what they do. Okay. Last, last question. You said you did several experiments to set up in order uh, to do this. You, you made a statement that you did rotation of the inner valves inside the manifold, stepping motor controls, airflow and positive rotation. Was this testing, did you document this testing anywhere? Um, yes. I didn't see it in the report. Uh, well, because some of it happened after the report. Yeah, most of it came together after the report. <laughs> um, so. But some of it was done before. Uh, we, for example, some of the, for example, the air flow, we used actually a balloon to find how much air uh, was coming out of this, uh, which is kind of funny, but in order to use uh, like a pitot tube, we would have to make sure the air is not turbulent, the airflow. And at that PSI, it was definitely turbulent. We calculated the rain so it's definitely going to be turbulent. So we can't use a pitot tube. So we had to use, it was kind of embarrassing, but we had to use like a balloon, fill it up with air, and then find the volume. Is that embarrassing? It's not embarrassing at all. It's, it's not, not the, super science. That's, that's not, not the first thing. It's not the super high yeah. tech. Yeah. That's not embarrassing <laughs> at all. Yeah. 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 The best yeah. with what we had. So. You'd, be yeah. sure You'd be shocked. We, we have billion dollar companies working off of graduated cylinders and uh, <laughs> fluid yeah. level changes. Flow rates using weight tanks. Yeah. 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 In this case, Stephanie James was nice enough to lend us some uh, photos. <laughs> 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 I contributed. Yeah. <laughs> Sponsored. Sponsored. Yeah. Yeah. We're so embarrassed we actually did a video of this, but we don't want to show it. <laughs> 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 So you did all the work in the past couple weeks, and then you didn't show any of it here? I was well, no. surprised, right? Well, I guess the, the main thing was that, that video of it actually spinning, because that was the culmination yeah. Oh, yeah, right. Yeah. Together. I mean, we had other videos, we know, it's just, it was just get, to get the numbers so we could do some calculations. Mm -hmm. Because otherwise, there's no way, there was no way of knowing. And also, like, for example, Shapeways took an extra week. I was really mad when they told me, oh, yeah, we're going to take an extra week to make your 3D printed part. And I was like, oh, yeah. Get used well, to that. Get used uh, to that. <laughs> well, well, yeah. In the real world. So, yeah, exactly. That's why I said this is definitely a learning experience. So that's why I have to put extra time on everything so you don't yeah. get these kinds of walls. So, yeah. Dr. Carnegie, no questions.
Yes, please. Just a couple quick ones about your fluid analysis. Oh, um, great. So you have a tank at 3,000 PSI? It's regularly down to 750. Okay, so you're at 750 still, yeah. right? Um, can you just comment a little bit on using very, very standard laminar flow um, analysis methods for that? As you just said, right, this is all pretty turbulent flow. Right. Um, and again, going back to the balloon thing, right? So how do you compare those analytical results with the, the balloon, things like that? We didn't. We no, just, we, used okay. the, we used the turbulent solver on console. Yeah. Oh, did, did you use console? Because I heard, uh, <laughs> OK. Yeah, we did console. use console, right? There was, some, there was some struggles with console. And, but OK, it's tough. Yeah. yeah. And we actually did also did a stress analysis because the original manifold involved with the work in the made out of Delbrin, so we wanted to prove, check that yeah. it did yeah. not <laughs> fail with all the pressure. I think uh, after we did the analysis, um, it was we had a good safety factor. But when we changed the stainless steel, we assumed already it was going to hold that pressure. Another question is just about degrees of freedom, right? So um, you're launching this at 75 degrees to the horizon, right? And then the only thing you're doing is rotating it in space. I, I just thought, I, it's hard it for me to little, see how, yeah, yeah. Yeah, it gets a little more complex. Just when, okay. they, when they launch it, it's actually going to spin at 4 hertz the, the way the fins are okay. for stability, so it's going to be a spin stabilizer. Sure, yeah, yeah. Um, then when it gets before the pitch maneuver, and then they're still going back and forth with this to see if they can actually have a system that will actually can pitch it while it's spinning, which yeah, this will good luck. be able to. Right, yeah. So they're, what, they're, what they really want to do is they want to uh, kind of extend booms, uh -huh. um, so de-spin it, pitch it over, and then re-spin it, and then you accelerate again. <laughs> and then actually do that <laughs> three more times. <laughs> <laughs> Is that gas yeah, so. tank big enough to do all Well, what, what, yeah. when it's on the rocket, like, we didn't have a, a picture, well, they don't have it completely made yet, but um, it's, it's, the, the diameter is about, uh, I, I just remember seeing it, so it's, it's about like this, right? Yeah. That's the diameter of it. Um, and the, uh, the actual solid rockets in there um, for the final stages are about like this. Mm -hmm. They're about eight, yeah, about eight inches or so. Um, so you'll have, you know, you'll have a good amount of, of room, on, on, you know, all completely around for rows of tanks if you need them. So just really quickly going back to that, um, if you need additional degrees of freedom, right? Right now you can go forward, back, and, and pitch and yaw, right? But um, what if you need some other degree of freedom up and down? Can you integrate another set? It, it seems to me you can, but you have to think about it, right? Yeah, what if you need it Z, we could Z put displacement in, or something? We could put in uh, four more. Right, right. And just narrow the range of the, the two ports of the valve right. inside so it just moves a little bit instead uh -huh. of 90 degrees each time. Right, right. Yeah, so that, but otherwise I think uh, it's a really interesting project. Yeah. Yeah. That, thank you. Thank you.